Hello, welcome to the Loney Show. I'm your host, Johnny Loney. In this episode, I don't have any regulars because who knows what? Who knows what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As for our guest, she's from Israel, currently in the Middle East. She specializes in special education and is also a college lecturer. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Abigail Gimple. Hey there, everybody. So nice to be here with you today. Anytime. So, how's life? Well, besides for no electricity this morning, life is beautiful. Thank God. Only I have only uh, good things to report. Oh, all right, then. Sounds good. And what have you been up to this recent week or so? Well, actually, this week, you're hitting me on a great week because my husband and I celebrated our 25th anniversary, and uh, we celebrated by staying in a beautiful hotel right on the Sea of Galilee for three days, and it was absolutely dreamy, and I cannot wrap my head around 25 years because I'm 25, so I'm not sure how we're married 25 years. But uh, go figure that one out. And we really are celebrating a life together, plus our six wonderful children. And uh, the special education thing comes up because most of my children are diagnosed with ADHD. So celebrating their successes, their remarkable personalities, and our time together as a couple, uh, which is has its highs and lows and everything in between. And I think that our children have raised us, we've raised each other, and uh, there's a lot to celebrate. Okay, fabulous. And tell, tell me more about what you do specifically for the last few years or so. So I've been, I'm a special education teacher, and I also teach in Herzog College here in Israel. And uh, my focus has been on ADHD for way more than a couple of years, for about 25 years now. Uh, because I started as a classroom teacher well before I became a mom, and uh, those kids with the with who are labeled as ADHD, and we were already busy, busy labeling them way back 25 years ago, and uh, those were the kids that really intrigued me in my classroom because they were the cutest, the smartest, the the most energetic, and and yet I could not get them to learn. So they posed such a challenge to me that I decided that that was going to be the challenge that I would meet. And I worked long and hard to create programs for them in the classroom. And my my small charges, they were third graders, and then I had some fifth graders and, and went on later on to, to teach in Israeli classrooms. We lived in Moscow, Russia for a couple of years, a very unpopular place nowadays. But back then we were not at war with Russia, so it was okay to admit that. And uh, in all my classrooms, my focus was obviously on teaching the entire class, but making sure that these remarkable students were part of the conversation and were flourishing in my classroom. So God has his funny ways. And uh, as my children were being uh, reaching uh, three years old, four years old in kindergarten, uh, the kindergarten teachers were saying, hmm, something's going on with these kids. They're they're the ones dancing in the middle of the circle at circle time. They're the ones touching everything and taking out the glitter when they don't have permission, stuff like that. And what's going on for them? And one after the next, it was being recommended that they be diagnosed with ADHD. And uh, that's when it, it really became personal. And I started doing a tremendous amount of research into what ADHD really is and uh, what our uh, treatment of choice is, which is obviously first line treatment is medication. So I wanted to find out more about that as well. So that's been my journey and it's, uh, it, it hasn't culminated, but it's certainly part of the journey has been the two books that I've published uh, recently on ADHD full intervention program, as well as the informed consent, uh, really getting a grip on what's going on medically and, uh, and if there is something going on medically and if medication is your best choice and really giving the parents the opportunity to understand in depth what's happening for their children and what and allowing them to make good choices for their children's intervention all right then sounds good and what what encouraged or inspired you to look look up more into special education that's an interesting question. I had always, as a little girl growing up in New York, had this dream of uh, living overseas. 
And I was trying first, I always loved children. I myself am from a family of eight and I'm not Amish or Mormon, uh, but there were a lot of siblings and I'm one of the older ones. So I was always uh, charged with the care of my younger siblings. And that was not something I resented. I actually, I'm crazy about my younger siblings and I took them with me wherever I went. So I was always very attached to children and an empathetic person. So I was able to kind of tap into the challenges that that kids were having just as they were going through life. So special education was was uh, natural. My my family always said because I like to argue, I like to kind of get to real truths. So it was either I was I was either going to be a lawyer or a teacher or an, an actress because I, I love a stage as well. Give me a microphone and uh, I'm having a great time. So those were my choices. But in terms of the dream of traveling the world and being able to uh, learn different cultures and meet different people, special education seemed to be the right fit because uh, it's something you can take with you. There are children everywhere that need special care and there are children everywhere that that need an adult who has the skills and the desire to really educate them and and lift their abilities. So that that's how I landed up where I did. And my and my own children definitely uh, made that journey even more intense because suddenly they were the children who needed my assistance. And uh, I, I'm very grateful that I was up for the task. Hmm. All right, then. Sounds good. Very good. So, and as your few years into special education, what, what, what have been some of the experiences that, that really highlights, or at least you have very fond memories of, as a special education teacher? Mm, that's a good question. I, the, I've i loved my career as a special educator. I have uh, parts of it that are with children, you know, actually being in the classroom and seeing kids come alive. And uh, <laughs> I remember one moment, I don't, I don't love math. It's, it was not one of my favorite subjects in school ever. And I was so grateful to just take my one math course in college and be done with it forever. But in my classroom, when I was when I was teaching, I was really taught to whatever I was teaching to really bring my entire heart and soul into it so that my students have permission to love it as well. And uh, so I was I'm teaching my my students math. And one of my students comes over to me, it's this little boy, such a cute kid. And he says to me, Miss Perlman, that's my maiden name. I know what your favorite subject is. You love math. And I said, oh my God, that's amazing. I managed to make math so nice for him and really be genuine about it that he he thought that I loved math. But that that's from my, the students, uh, the, my small students and uh, my bigger students, my college students, what I really love is when we start the semester and they, even though they are, these are, a lot of my students are returning teachers that are coming back to get their, finish up their degree. And they've been in the classroom for a very long time already. But I, so that's where I meet them. And I love teaching them because we have common language. We understand the classroom, uh, my students and myself. But what I love is that when I introduce ADHD from a different perspective, my students, they argue with me like crazy and, and they've met these kids with ADHD. So they have a lot to say about it. And we really fight it out and we discuss it. And I bring the information that I have found. And by the end of the semester, we've grown so much together. And my students have a completely different perspective that they never would have had had they not been presented with this new information. And that's incredibly gratifying to me. Okay, I can see that. So, okay, this is coming from the top of my head. Have you ever thought about living in a city where it's all just majority of low rise, mixed use facilities and buildings that feels like a well knit community? But yeah, mm -hmm. there's so many people living in the city that you may not even notice. Like it's, it's overwhelming to so many people. But yeah, there's so many, so little tall buildings. It's like, what's going on here? What? There's so much to process. Have you thought about well, that? It's interesting you're saying that because uh, Moscow, especially the area I lived in, 
was essentially a huge city with low rise buildings. Uh, most of the buildings were not over five stories high, and but it was this sprawling metropolis, you know, going from one side of Moscow to the other is basically the entire length of Israel. It's so, you know, it takes you about seven hours or six or seven hours to drive from one end to the next. You don't know your neighbors at all. And there's so much going on below the surface. And yet you're just like, you could be completely oblivious to it. You could not meet anyone at all, all day long, not connect with anyone. And I, I didn't like that at all. That was that was not my idea of a good idea. I, I now live in a, uh, in a community where it's a real community. People connect with each other all the time. People go to each other's celebrations. I was I was just last night with my youngest daughter. We went to a pre pre wedding celebration, and it was just fantastic. And it was it was just for women, and we had a just a ball of a time. That that's really my idea of uh, the way we should be living. And I I kind of feel. I kind of feel bad for people who are forced into a situation where they, where they have to be living in one of those kind of huge cities that, that they don't have people who really care about them because connecting is what makes us grow. It makes us feel like we exist and, and people care about us and, uh, and it brings out the best in us. And I don't think that these anonymous big giant cities are, are good for anybody. Yeah, you know what? I absolutely agree. There's got to be some moderation in terms of what is built and what purpose they serve. Yeah, I agree with you. And and listen, you know, sometimes we can't get away from the the big city living. And I'm a New Yorker, so I I actually love the big city. I love going to visit New York. I took my kids there. My uh, my kids who who live in these close-knit warm community and I, I took them to manhattan within half an hour they were all begging me mom take us home we don't like it here it was too loud it was too crowded there were too many people there but me i love it i, I love the energy of the city but I, I think that if people do have to live in a city then there should be some way to create community even within buildings within small neighborhoods and and then it would be okay but you know the, i think what we learned from the covid era is that we don't do well locked in our own homes without neighbors and friends that we can see on a daily basis that connect with us that we connect with that that we care about each other people fell apart so living in a big city is is almost that and uh, we, we need to learn to connect and not through social media, but in person, looking at each other, touching each other, caring about each other's families in order for life to feel more meaningful. Absolutely. What caused you to feel nostalgia recently? Nostalgia? Well, 25th anniversary definitely made me nostalgic. Uh, my daughter just got married. And uh, that was that was a really nostalgic experience, just going back into her little girl pictures and bringing us back to our own wedding. And, uh, you know, going through, we went through tons of pictures in order to to make nice parties for her pre-wedding, post-wedding and, and her husband, obviously. We like him, too. He's amazing. Um, but that was definitely a wonderful nostalgic experience. Fabulous. Have you ever experienced something supernatural? Oh, so many times. I try not to admit this too often because people think I'm crazy. But I have had experiences where I dreamed something that happened the next day. Now, some people say, oh, OK, that's very easy. You dream something and then you kind of act it out the next day. But I had a dream about a car accident. And in my dream, my friend and colleague was driving and we were driving past for the New Yorkers listening to this. I know you are definitely not a New Yorker just based on your accent. Uh, but uh, anyone who's from New York knows that, you know, this, this is that big wide road passing by uh, Kennedy Airport. And my in my dream, we were the two of us were driving right past Kennedy Airport and I actually dreamed the location of the car accident and what would happen that she would just smash into the back of the car in front of us, 
To this day, I don't know why she did that. And I already knew what response I was going to have because she had to catch a flight that night to California. And I said to her in my dream, in the accident that hadn't happened, listen, I'll stay with the car. You get a taxi home so that you don't miss your flight to California. And then the very next day at three in the afternoon, she rammed into a car in front of us and uh, right, right driving past Kennedy Airport. And a second after she rammed the car, she goes into shock. And I say, don't worry about it. I got this. You have a flight to California. I'm going to take care of it. And she looked at me like I was really the craziest person on the planet. She says, how are you so calm? I said, it's no big deal. I already had this accident last night in my dream. So <laughs> that didn't make her think I was any more normal. But uh, that's just one example of these kind of weird experiences. I've had a few, a few more like it, one very, very recently. So uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> It kind of makes it make you it makes you sound kind of psychic if you had a dream about something you're yet you're yet to experience in real life. Isn't that weird? Yeah, I mean, it's I'm weird, not but, psychic. Yeah, but just saying that makes you look like you're psychic to an extent. <laughs> it does. I don't. I'm not exactly sure what to do with it, but uh, I I find it interesting, and like I said. Usually I don't tell it to people because they think I'm nuts, but this is, this is true. This is exactly how it happened and uh, not once and not twice. Yeah, that's mad. That's right. crazy. Yeah. What has taken you the longest to get good or decent at? Oh my God. Um, cooking. I'm really good at it now but just having a churning out dinner for my family. And, uh, you know, we, we often have guests over the weekend and I, I make parties in my house. So we'll, we'll have 30, 40 people over without really thinking about it today. But when we first got married, I was such a disaster. Just making pasta was, was overwhelming to me. I would, I would serve my husband for dinner every once in a while. I'd just like boil some eggs and open up a can of baked beans and that would be dinner. And I slowly over the years had to like study other people and go to people's houses. How do you do this? And I remember trying to make a chicken and uh, I was sold the chicken full, complete, and I had to cut it up. It took me, I don't know, four or five hours to figure out how to cut the chicken because no one had told me that you just cut it on the joints. So it was, it was a disaster. But today, I would say 25 years into this, I, I really essentially am cooking in my sleep. I could just whip up a meal without really thinking twice. It's no effort anymore. I listen to something interesting, a podcast, perhaps like one of your podcasts, and, uh, and the whole thing goes very smoothly. So don't give up. There's hope. Oh, yes. It always is. What kind of music do you often listen to? Oh my God, this is more embarrassing than the psychic question. I'm actually an 80s girl. And that's something that I admit even less than I admit that I dream things that happen the next day. Because uh, <laughs> I talk to my husband about this a lot. He he grew up in the same era as me. We were both born in the uh, early 70s, I'm, I'm mid 70s. and uh, But he grew up with money. So back in the day, if you want to listen to music, you either turned on the radio or you bought tapes or CDs. And he had the money to go and buy CDs. So he actually has proper taste in music. He loves 70s music. He's he's always playing these songs like from back in the day that I didn't hear when I was growing up. But growing up poor, the only music I had was what were they were playing on the radio. So that's my music taste to this day. And I, that, that and that's super nostalgic, by the way. The minute an, a nice 80s song comes on, I am just 15 again at a jukebox somewhere with a bunch of friends shooting pool. You know, I like, I like 80s music too. So I don't say what the big fuss is. I am, like, I it, really it's, it's a vibe. Yeah, it's, <laughs> 80s music <laughs> is a vibe. I yeah, like think about it. The big hair and the tacky clothing and the weird colors, like Cindy Lauper just dancing around with these bizarre outfits and these thick belts. She looked weird. She looked strange. 
I, I love her music. Girls just want to have fun is like way at the top of my list. Madonna looked ridiculous back then. So it's, it's hard to admit that you like this stuff because the music also was like a little bit electronic. It wasn't like they weren't really using the real instruments. Like they, they <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, it's not high society. Yeah, I, I, I can understand that concept. But of course, it, it, music is music and music is subjective. We like whatever we like. But, the, but in my opinion, 80s music is, is a banger. So, Well, I'm so glad you said that. I feel a little bit less embarrassed now. I mean, why, why be embarrassed in the first place? Like, You, you're right. yeah, we all, we all have our own taste in music. So, yeah, it, it doesn't matter, to be honest. You're 100% right. I'm adopting your perspective from now on. Fabulous. Where do you see yourself 20 years from now? Well, I hope to be a, a grandmother. Uh, that would be wonderful. I, I look forward to that stage of my life. And I, uh, I definitely see myself uh, being able to create a, uh, a program or some other, maybe a center for people who are not getting proper help for their children but can't afford it, um, can come and can get the help they need, the resources they need without having to empty their bank account. I hope to be able to um, be involved in kind of shifting and changing the way we look at special needs and the way we treat it. And um, if, if that voice, that message could come out, I would feel very, very gratified because I feel like I've really made a, an impression on many, many children who need the help and are not getting it and are just, um, you know, being treated kind of like batches of children instead of looking at each individual child and really analyzing what's going on for them. So if I could help with with legislation for for childhood and and children with special needs or with uh, just grassroots movements for parents, then that would be fantastic. Okay, then. Sounds good. Sounds good. What is the one thing you can't live without? I think I'd be, besides for my family, I'm assuming, because I can't live without my family. Besides for that, I would say I, I love to read and I, I must have my books. Ah, uh, yes. Very good. What restaurant do you eat at most often? Um, I love, I, I actually love restaurants that, that serve like really fresh, big salads. So, so I'm very lucky because here in Israel, where I'm living now, they, there are amazing restaurants and, and whether I'm choosing a steak place or I'm going to, uh, you know, a, a, a decadent kind of pancake place because my kids love that a waffle joint. I'm always going to be able to order a really great, satisfying, fresh salad because Israelis love their fresh vegetables. And uh, I get that wherever I go. All right, then. Sounds good. Have you been on any interesting trips lately? So I was in Vienna recently with my husband. And uh, that was less interesting. So I'm going to talk about the trip before that, which was to Hong Kong. We, I joke that we brought uh, COVID to Israel. We didn't. But we were in, in uh, Hong Kong, December of 2019. So um, that's our joke. We, we came back feeling perfectly healthy. If there's any Israelis listening, it wasn't our fault. Um, but apparently, we didn't know it at the time, apparently COVID was kind of bouncing around China and Hong Kong uh, when we were there. Uh, but the, the Chinese wear masks all the time. So they were keeping us safe, which was very nice. Uh, that was an amazing trip. I, I found the culture fascinating. It is a beautiful, beautiful country. We went out to different islands. We got to see a real fishing village, not, not a pretend one, not one made by Hollywood, but a real fishing village where people, their houses are, are actually structured on the water. And they, they, they could fish in, out their window in the morning. And uh, it was wonderful to speak to people, local people. And uh, that was probably my best trip ever. 
and I highly recommend it. Okay, then. Brilliant. What habit do you find yourself doing without thinking about it? A, a good one or a bad one? Either way. Okay, so uh, we'll start with the bad one. I, uh, I definitely do not like um, when I have any kind of bumps on my, on my skin. So I tend to scratch at my skin when I'm not paying attention to, uh, smooth it out, which never does smooth it out, always makes it worse. So that's something that I, that I have to work on. Um, a positive habit that I'm not paying attention to, but happens often is that I tend to notice, uh, nice things about people. And, um, I like to give compliments so I, I, without even realizing it, I, I tend to be a little overflowy with, with noticing nice things about people and letting them know about it. And what's nice about that is that I've, I've seen that with my oldest daughter, it's, it's gotten contagious and, and she'll just randomly go up to a person on the bus and say, you have a beautiful nose. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's good. The good habit at least is passing on. Here's hoping she doesn't take my bad habits. Okay. That's nice. Just like randomly complimenting for whatever reason just like oh you look pretty nice shoes and so on that's actually pretty nice uh, i never thought about that yeah it's, it's done me well it was it was uh, something i had worked on earlier on because I, I don't come from a place where there was natural complimenting my my family is of uh german descent and uh that it's not that that's not a flowy complimenty kind of culture. I'm not going to say that there are not wonderful Germans who are overflowing with compliments. It's just not part of their, their, uh, you know, natural, uh, behavior. So that was something early on that I felt like, well, I need to add more of this. And I guess I practiced it for long enough for it to become just an unconscious habit. Okay, cool, cool. What would a world populated by clones of you be like? <laughs> I like your questions. <laughs> Who would have thought of that? A world populated. That's interesting. Um, I, I think the people might land up being a little bit tired because I'm a, a tiny bit of an over, uh, overachiever. So uh, they probably the people would be desperate for a vacation and the vacation spots would not be uh, full enough. They'd be a little bit frustrated with that. But I would, I would hope that it would be a happy world, a world where people got along with each other and cared about each other. That, that would be my hope. Although uh, I, probably a little boring. Imagine just, just me being cloned. My God, you know, it's, we need all the different personalities around. So people might be nice to each other and all, but maybe, maybe a little bit boring. Yeah, I suppose that is the case, but you just got to make do where do. You. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which pizza topic do you most relate to? Pizza topping? Mm -hmm. um, I, I love mushrooms. So that would definitely be my favorite. All right, then. What's your favorite season? Oh, summer, without even a question. We have the beautiful summer here, no clouds in the sky, no rain. And uh, we're, we're just wrapping up the rainy season now, which I'm very grateful for and hope it ends faster. Um, and the summer is glorious. You don't have to put anything, you know, any extra layers on and it's just always beautiful outside. I, I love a, uh, an evening stroll in the summer where it's just warm and, and the flowers smell beautiful in the evening. They just put out their scent as they're kind of going to sleep for the night. And uh, I just cherish that or a nice barbecue out in the yard in the evening when it's just warm. Oh my God, wonderful. And I'm, I, I'm grateful that I live in the Middle East where we have a nice long summer, which my family complains about, but I'm just happy all summer long. Oh yes, now that's quite the dream. All hot, all sunny, year round. That's, right? that's my kind of climate. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> you like that too, huh? Yes, I do like long, hot, and sunny summers. But at the same time, I do like times where it, there's like a cold temperature, but all, and winter kind of thing. 
so long it's one of the two is very consistent year round. If it's one of the other switching back and forth year round, then nah, that that's not my kind of thing. One or I the agree. other, no in between. I that is it. When we lived in in Moscow, it was very much one or the other. the The winter began in uh, mid September and ended somewhere around May. Um, that's when the the temperatures finally came up above zero. And uh, yeah, that was miserable. That that first winter we were there, it snowed 17 days straight. And I was like, I felt like I was slowly falling apart. This was like a nightmare. Oh my God, how do we manage this? How do the people like live here and smile and be happy? I did not know how they could do that. Yeah, I questioned that too. And to be honest, I would really want to be in a city where it snows a lot of the time, like just recently, right now, last few, last few weeks, it has been snowing throughout the since start of start of March, when it usually should have been snowing in December. So, uh, a bit, I mean, it's a bit late for Norway to give us snow, but uh, thanks anyway, I guess. Well, you get a nice long winter. Oh well, yes, yeah. But the thing is, the snow comes a little later in the year, like. February or March time rather than December. Like, uh-huh. uh, yeah, why well, keep we, hoarding, we why hoarding the snow, Norway? What's that? Yeah, yeah I, was, I was like, why are you hoarding the snow, Norway? Give it, give it, <laughs> give us a bit of some, you know? So is Norway equipped for snow? Because I know when it snows here in the Middle East, everything shuts down for a week and it's a couple of flurries. And for a New Yorker, it's absolutely ridiculous. But at least do the Norwegians know how to handle it? Yeah, like, they're, they're known for high mountains and valleys. That, like, it, even even in our spring and autumn time, there is at least sufficient amount of snow. Summertime, it's still, even though there's a little amount of snow, it's still wet, miles more than what we've gotten, like, last few weeks. So, uh-huh. yeah, you know, always uh, well known for its snow, for sure. Yeah, do you like to uh, ski? You like winter sports? Oh yeah, I do love winter sports. Uh huh. That's my nightmare. I definitely do not like winter sports. We we oh. go skiing once a year, and I make sandwiches and hot cocoa in the lodge, and that's my job. As I I my first time skiing, I I rammed straight into a pole. I don't know what the pole was doing there, and sprained my arm, and I was like, okay. This is, I, I want to be on solid ground. I don't want to be slipping. And, um, and I'm, you know, I'll jump in a pool. I'll, I'll go bungee jumping. Just don't make me slip. Oh, uh, yes. I can see that. Yeah. So skiing has never been my friend. I can understand that. And that is all we have for this episode. It was great having you here, Abigail, talking about your works in special education and your travels and wow that's a lot of things really that's been amazing well thank you so much and if um anyone wants to reach out to me the best way to do that would be through my website which is called hyperhealing.org and i'd love to hear from you all right all right sounds good thank you so much and until next time stay tuned for more